Hey everybody, welcome to episode 43 of Making It. I'm Bob Claggett, here with Jimmy Duresta. Hello. And David Picciuto. Howdy. How's it going? Very good. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing pretty What's well. Up? Good. Hello, Super rainy day outside, which is kind of weird for here. Oh, really? Yeah. It's actually really nice here. Yeah, it's really windy here. Jimmy, you got wind coming. Oh, oh no. <laughs> it's a little chilly today, but not so bad. Nice. It's, so bad. it's super rainy here, and I was driving around earlier, and um, Savannah floods really badly. So there's certain parts of town, because we're basically at sea level, and so there's certain parts of town that just fill up, and you'll get like a foot of standing water in these, you know, on the sides of roads and stuff. And uh, I've been thinking about adding a snorkel to my Land Cruiser, and so driving around today, I was like... <laughs> I totally don't need that, but that's a pretty good reason right there. So. <laughs> no, because you're going to go up your window and be all yeah. like badass looking. Yep, <laughs> comes off the side, goes up. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, I can't wait. I've actually got it in. I just haven't done the work yet to put it in place. So, If your car is that much underwater, you should also make a sign that you can stick out of the moonroof that says help. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> no, I don't need help. That's the thing. With the snorkel, I won't need help. I'll be going around pulling everybody else off. So. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so. So. Cool. Well, uh, what have you guys been up to? What's what are you working on? Right now, I'm working on a Halloween mask for Kelly. She's going to a Halloween party this coming weekend. Uh, it's using laser engraver and veneers and bent lamination. Uh, I'm doing a video on it, of course, but the video I don't think will be out before Halloween. So it will probably be a few weeks. It might be one of those videos I sit on for a little bit. And That's why you got to get your Halloween videos in early. I know. Yeah. I know. So I, th- I think I think there's some good tips and tricks in this video that will apply to a lot of things. So it, it's I'll, I'll try to keep it not so Halloween. So when people point. make their Christmas masks, they exactly. don't know how to do it. There you go. <laughs> their Thanksgiving masks. Yes. <laughs> and then... Uh, yeah. I think I think that's about it. A couple other little things going on. I got lots of videos to edit. And as I say this, we just lost Jimmy. Oh, he's back. We got video again. Yeah, we got video sorry. again. So yeah. I, I play with my buttons, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you push buttons and you play with buttons. <laughs> a good day today on YouTube. <laughs> Today's <Jimmy>. Tuesday. <laughs> but uh, I'm working on a um, a sign that has loads of letters. I'm going to do a little Snapchat on it once we're done. I meant to do it this morning, but I'm working on a sign for the the location at Grand Central Station where I made the Sigmund. It's actually Sigmund's is the name of the of the food court spot, and I'm making a sign for them. It has a hundred letters in it, hundreds of letters in it. So it's a real involved process, and I'm going to spray paint those letters. So, uh, like I said, I'm going to Snapchat about that a little bit. So by now, people will have seen that. Um, I finished up a Corian cube light. It's been it's that was on awesome, my, by the way. That was on my Instagram. Thank you. Yeah, I just finished that video. That's my Core 77 video. Really simple. I've been wanting to make pyramids. I've seen it. I saw it once. My a friend of mine in the neighborhood makes all this really goth looking, really cool leather work, Brooklyn leather works. He's a friend of mine, Ted. And so Ted always has these pyramids in his furniture and stuff. And I said, those are incredible. Where do you get them? And he says, he has his friend see and see them, mostly out of MDF. And then he like impregnates them with dyes and resins and stuff. And so I, I always wanted to try them. And then this opportunity for me to make this Corian, something with Corian. I just knew I wanted to make a video with Corian. And then I thought this was a good application for it. And then I had this old strip of LED lights that I stuck in there. So uh, that was fun. So I really liked that. So that was really just an exploration and CNC. And so, um, and then uh, a knife made from an old file. So I'm going to work on that a little bit more today. That's hopefully maybe I'll have that ready for my Sunday video. But that's exciting. And then I just put up my bottle opener video, which, like I said, this is great, by the way. Thank you. That was, uh, I'm working for PR companies sometimes, and they saw my alcohol videos, and then they said, hey, can you do stuff for beer? And I've done a couple things for them so far. My my case, my 24-pack case was for them. And then this one, and uh, I, they they don't they don't get on my back at all. They just say come up with something fun, and so I just that's totally off the top of my head. And I did one video, which was on my Instagram, and I was afraid it was not enough. I knew it wasn't enough, so I was going to do like four of them. And then I was like, you know what, ten is a nice even number, and then it'll force me to come up with some unusual ones. And so ten bottle openers from ten tools. Nice. And it's did you just videos. come up with them on the spot, all in one day? Uh, no, as I went, I just kept digging through my tool bins and saying, "Oh, I could make this into one. I could make that into one." And and it's funny when you just when you 
I always tell my students, when you have to dig in and keep thinking and keep thinking, you know, you say to yourself, okay, I'm not getting up from this table until I at least come up with four good ideas for YouTube videos, right? You know, that's just as an example. And I did the same thing for myself here. I said, I'm going to come up with 10 bottle openers. I have a bunch that were just kind of too simple. And it, you could basically put a notch in anything that's metal. So I was also kind of thinking in terms of what would look good on camera and what would be sort of practical tools that most people would have sitting around. And uh, so I came up with more than 10 ultimately, but they were all inspired by just digging through the drawers. And then like, for instance, that old Stanley uh, cement chisel was one I did. And the reason I picked that is because I just bought those crazy drill bits that we saw at WIA and I knew I could drill through hardened steel. So I was like, I, if if I didn't have that new pack of drill bits to drill through hardened steel, I wouldn't even have thought about. It. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my time trying to drill through this. I could never do it. And so with the pack of drill bits, I was like, oh, there's no limitations. I could drill through hardened steel. So it was, uh, you know, it's just when you come up with stuff, when you work on ideas, it's good to have all these different resources. You know, you buy stuff and you just don't know where it's going to come into play, but eventually it does. So the drill bits were a good example. And then I did the one on the saw. I was trying to think of a practical way to do like a just a regular old crosscut saw. And I have tons of those. They come to me. Every time I buy a toolbox, there's an old rusty one in it. And people who know me say, oh, do you want this? This is my dad's old saw. You know, And they're all mostly garbage. Nothing's usually ever really good or usable. And so I save them to plasma cut holes in them just to get people mad at me. So. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're honest about it. Yeah. So I, I set up my plasma cutter from Longevity. And uh, I just plasma cut out that little notch. You know, basically any beer bottle opener is just like a square notch, about one and a quarter inches wide by about one inch with a little thumb thing at the bottom. Hmm. So it was fun. It was a lot of fun to, to force myself to come up with those. And um, <clears throat> then what else am I working on? And we're up at the house right now. So I'm just doing some housework. We had a guy come and he's going to shock our well. We've got some problems with our well. So we're just dealing with that. And uh, that's it. Living in the country for a couple of days. It's nice up here. Nice. I bet yeah. it's much quieter. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I, I could spend the rest of my life up here. I really, I, I just cut out all these letters on the band. So, which I'll probably Instagram a picture of it. But I literally had my band so set up in the grass. And for about three hours yesterday, I just stood at my band so outside in the grass, <laughs> band sawing <laughs> letters. And I, I didn't count the letters, but I mean, on a, there's got to be at least 200 letters in the sign, all hand cut letters, you know, from like one inch high to four inches high. Somebody basically made this. I didn't do the graphic, but it's, it looks like a, an old typesetter's block where the letters are all just jammed together in this big square. And so there's little letters, big letters, and it just says all the things the restaurant sells and, and makes. Hmm. And um, they're all vintage letters with big serifs, like old printing block letters. So everything had a serif and... I used in my old band, so which I haven't cranked up in a while. It runs good. And it was so nice to be able to make sawdust and just watch it blow away. <laughs> Not have to worry about cleaning it up. It just blew away as I cut. This sawdust was just floating into the grass. So, yeah. Natural it's, dust it's collection. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Let's let it go back to Mother Earth. That's awesome. We you know where all the MDF comes from, Mother Earth. <laughs> the, yeah, the MDF mines of North Carolina. They <laughs> <laughs> yeah. get out of the ground. <laughs> yeah. So cool. all my grass will be dead under my when my band saw <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I've been working on a uh, serving tray. I, I used to make these serving trays quite a bit, and I sold a lot of them and gave them away as gifts and stuff. And uh, I was wanting to do like a woodworking project. I haven't done as much woodworking lately, and I was just kind of looking for something. And then it dawned on me that I never made a video about these these trays, and they're really simple. But um, so I ended up making one of those a couple days ago and working on the video for that, trying to get that done. And got a couple other ones that are coming up in the next few weeks that I've been uh, trying to get the stuff out of the way for. So I can finally spend some time on my arcade machine, hopefully this month. So that's the plan. Are you going to, when you, when you do your arcade machine, are you going to kind of jigsaw out all the sides? You're going to show all those steps, right? Yeah. I'm trying to show everything for it. And uh, is that what you're planning on? I mean, cause just as a little, advice you could jigsaw out one and get a perfect and then pattern cut the second one right if you're gonna have two similar sides yeah 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 that's the plan i'll, I'll do one you know by hand get it cleaned up and then use a flush trim bit and yeah because a lot of people make the mistake they think they can cut through two layers of plywood with a jigsaw oh no and yeah no yeah, when you get to the other side it's all wonky because the, the bit never goes very straight yeah i mean i i really dislike the jigsaw so i would yeah it's, it it's hard any more than i have to you know but yeah 
You know what's actually good, Bob? Uh, just as another matter of suggestion, if you have a track saw, because I've cut out some crazy shapes just using a track saw. So if you can cut out predominantly most of what you're doing with the track saw, you know, just lay it flat on the table. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just picturing the side of, a, of an arcade machine, how I know it's kind of got like a bump in and then back up and then out and then yeah. the bevel top. So if you just lay a piece of plywood down, you know, for your first one and just put the track saw on all the straight sides. And even if you just cut into the corners and get close, and then you could then use the jigsaw to connect those two cuts. Yeah. I don't have a track saw. I mean, I was just going to use a, a you know circular saw for the same thing and just set right. a straight edge. So I guess that's about the same. Yeah. But yeah, so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to get to that. I'm still trying to work out exactly how to make that in my shop because, you know, it's like, I don't know, six feet tall, like three feet deep. And so I have to make two of those panels. And then attach them with something across that's going to be two or three feet wide. And so I don't really have, I mean, I, I measured it out and I will have enough room technically to get it in there. <laughs> but you like, you have to build not, it in space. Yeah, but I'm not sure if I'm actually going to be able to move around it and film around it. That's one of the things I've been trying to figure out for a long time. So, can you build it outside? Can you can you get like pop up a tent and just build it onto the tent? Uh, I mean, I could, I have a carport out front. I could probably build it out there, but then, you know. Your neighbors are all looking at you in the background. Oh, they all do that anyway. I mean, they see me walking around <laughs> the front yard with a camera and all sorts of stuff. And no, that's when they look over the fence, just squirt them in the eye with a Windex or something. <laughs> no, uh, something they, harmless. Yeah, they don't seem to care that I. <laughs> I mean, our kids are loud enough that they anything else seems pretty tame. I think so. <laughs> right, right. But so um, we had some good feedback from last week where we just kind of like rambled for a yeah. while, and uh, so that was surprising to me that people yeah, I thought that was going to be a bad review on that one <laughs> I yeah, really did I did too but people seem to like it so yeah. maybe we'll try to fit in more smaller topics you know in the future I don't know but um, so today we're talking about two topics today right yeah I guess so we're, we're going to talk about uh, uh, we just decided and tell me if I'm wrong we decided to talk about what brought us to YouTube what what was that moment in time where we said okay now it's time to go to YouTube and then also um what is our next big tool purchase? So let's and, start. Let's start with that. Well, also, I wanted to also we can come back to it, but I want to talk a little bit more about the YouTube Red stuff, the subscription thing. Oh yeah, I've heard a little bit more since last week about that. But yeah, let's talk about the tool thing first. Actually, you know, let's let's you tell me about Red because I want to make sure I'm in the right ballpark here because I just got out of my network. Uh, I was in a channel network, and a lot of people ask me, you know, young YouTubers or or should I say new YouTubers with young channels ask me all the time and I personally just spent two years in uh, CDS and I just like to say that uh, I'm glad I'm out and it didn't do me any good. Everybody who owns a channel, you will get contacted directly. They won't contact your agent because they don't know you. They don't know your agent. They just know you. So, I mean, my advice is to just stay on on your own, but you know, it just took me two years to learn that. So, Hmm. So with the... Yeah, the uh, YouTube Red stuff, you know, we talked about last week. In case somebody missed it, it's a subscription service. YouTube is going to stay the same as it is now, but then they're adding on top of that, if you'd want to pay $10 a month, you don't have to watch ads. So they remove all the ads from the videos for the people that pay that $10 a month. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, theoretically, it should do better for us as creators. We should get more money out of it. Um, so I saw... So there's a few things that have come up like since we talked about it last week. One, right after we released it, the episode, there was a big story going around how about how um, if a creator on YouTube didn't check that box that we were talking about checking, you know, the one yeah. that we were worried about, <laughs> yeah. if, if they didn't do that, then YouTube was going to private all their videos. So right. if, you, if you don't agree to be part of this subscription service, then they yeah. automatically private all your videos and so a lot of people were throwing a fit about that being like, you know, them taking away your revenue or taking away, taking control away from you about your own videos and stuff. And I guess I kind of understand that. But the more I've heard about that thing is it's really about like if you're there um, and you're monetizing your videos, you're a part of their system to make money off the ads that are being shown over your videos. And so the issue is if you want to be a part of the ad income but not a part of the subscription income that's where they're drawing the line and saying like well do you want to make money off YouTube or not if you do then you have to check this box and say yes I'm going to make money off subscriptions Mm -hmm. and ads and whoever you know uses them or 
your videos are going to be private and you can't monetize them at all. And I, I don't know. To me, that makes sense. I don't think that's a big deal personally. But yeah, no. As long as you opt in, and I panicked a little bit last week, and, I, and you know, I panicked a little off air because I didn't know if I was opted in or not because I was at that moment I was still part of my channel partner. And when you're in a channel partner network, there are some pages on your YouTube Creative Studio that aren't available to you. Right. And I learned that all in the, in the hours after we got off the air last week, and I was panicking. And uh, I, I was opted in by my network, but they were just never very communicative with me, and so I didn't know anything. I had to ask them very specific questions, you know, which I only got educated on last week. And then they did eventually say, "Yeah, you're opted in. Don't worry about it." And then a couple of days later, I had no obligation with them, and I'm out. I'm out of the thing. So just bad timing for me, but yeah, uh, I'm in a good. I'm in a good standing. So. Yeah, so that that is a big concern that people, a lot of people were concerned about, like, oh no, my videos are going to disappear or something, but it's really just a matter of them, you know, you trying to decide if you want to be able to monetize your videos or not, and this is just a new terms of service, you know, just like if you get a, if you download a new piece of software, you have to sign a terms of service saying you're not going to, like, blow up the world with that software or whatever. So, yeah, that's one thing, and then I saw... Um, some two interesting videos today, and I'll put links to them in the description or in the show notes. But um, one was from Tim Schmoyer, who I talked about last week, and he just put the video out like this afternoon, right before we started this. And it was like a list of ten reasons why this is going to be a good thing for YouTube. Five? Was it five things? I think it was five. Oh, it was somewhere between five and ten <laughs> things. I don't know. Maybe it was five. But no, anyway. I, I read up a little bit about it. I didn't see Tim's uh, video yet, but uh, it seems like it could be good. Yeah, I think it'll be I very good. I hope it's going to be good. Yeah. So um, I'll put a link down there. That's worth watching. And then that he links to another video from uh, Hank Green, who is a super famous YouTuber. And um, he has a really kind of long but very interesting video about like why why this could be better and talks about like why creators will actually make more money off of this versus ads and what it can potentially do to the ad ecosystem and how much people are making on ads, you know, because they're going to become more precious because less people are going to see them. So potentially the people that are, the companies that are buying ads to put over our videos will be paying more for them because there are fewer places for those ads to show up as people go to the subscription stuff. So anyway, he, he explains it really well. And those are, there's some interesting topics coming up around it, you know, and how it's changing and like what it can be five, ten years from now and like stuff like that. Actually, you, you just you, – you'd segued into something. Do you guys remember that email I sent you this morning? Uh, I'll talk about it. I'll give you the background on it. So I got contacted by a PR agency that basically said, do you want to be involved with Craftsman? And I said, I said I'm curious. Tell me what the next step is. And the very next step was a 10-page contract, which basically was completely skewed in the favor of them. And so I wrote back. I was like, you want a video from me? It's $10,000. And I own it, and that you only get to use it for one year. I knew he would say no to that, he, but he did say, "Let me ask my client." Um, so he came back to me this morning, and he said, "He said thank you, but my client will pass on this." And so I wrote back to him, and I said, "You and other PR agencies basically think that you're contacting YouTubers, and you're going to basically take advantage of us with these ridiculous contracts." I said, "You want your stuff to be represented as cool?" I said you got to play the game a little bit more honestly and a little bit more open and a little bit more flexible. I mean, I could read the email verbatim, but I can't find it this very second. But I basically slapped him in the face and said, you know, you can't just call YouTubers and say, oh, you, you, we're going to give you free tools and you're going to talk about our tools. So I, I enlightened this guy that, you know, most YouTubers talk. I said uh, that it's important to treat us with respect. And if you really, you know, you're willing to pay this much money for a commercial for network TV, you're talking directly to the fans of the people that are doing exactly what you want. You know, you're, this is like direct marketing, but you're, you're treating it as if like a, a passing fad and you're not giving us respectable offers. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I said free tools are only going to get you so far. So I said, you might get some, you know, young, younger channels that are just, you know, looking for anything. But uh, as I personally found out and, you know, some of us, so you guys too, you know, you do a commercial and you feel like you've just been taken advantage of. Uh, I said, if you don't want people to feel like they've been taken advantage of, give them real offers. So I basically gave this guy, you know, a piece of my mind. I cursed a little bit, and uh, it was a little salty. You guys both saw the email, but he wrote back to me just an hour ago, and he said, he said, thank you for the open, honest insight. Hmm. 
I, I said, if you, you know, basically I, I said to him, if you, you know, if you want the respect of you, the YouTube community, treat us with respect and treat us as if, you know, we're like real people and that we're not just going to jump. I guess the gist of my email was like, you're not offering us the, the wonderful opportunity to work for craftsmen. I said, it's the other way around. I said, <laughs> us as YouTubers are offering craftsmen the wonderful opportunity to be introduced to our audience. Hmm. And that's what I said to him. And that was, I doubt I should have said that earlier in my long diatribe. Sorry. But <laughs> when I said that to him, you know, he, he basically acknowledged it and said, okay. And I said, because you guys are just, you know, everyone sees these big brands and everyone's just like rolls their eyes. It's like, if you want your brand to be represented as cool, you got to treat us as if we're cool people. And don't think that we're going to come running when yeah. you say in your opening email, there's a few spots left and we're looking for just a couple of more YouTubers. <laughs> Every email says there's a few opportunities left. We've chosen a few YouTubers and there's a few left. Everyone, I'm like, how stupid do you think we are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've dealt with that a little bit as far as like people um, sending me offers and being like, I really think your, your audience is really going to like my foldable couch. Right. Can you do a video on it? And I'm like, I make things. Why would I show someone your couch? And they're right. like, I think they would find value in it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but my audience is more important than advertisers. And if it makes sense, I will show them what you do. But if it doesn't make sense, I'm not just going to shill your stuff. You know, <laughs> I'm not just yeah. going to like, I don't know. But yeah, I think there's a definitely an old media mentality that's still. Yeah, you know, no, they really have to. I mean, and so, I mean, the more and more I get these opportunities, uh, the more and more I'm just basically like. You know, the right one's going to come along and it's going to be, it's going to fit. You know, of course, I hit them with these, I call them these, these FU quotes. I say basically the F off quote. I give you the F off quote. And one of these days I'll get it. But until then, it's basically just like, you know, it, I, it just doesn't feel right. I think you've also in the past have expressed your feelings towards craftsmen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> craftsmen's not so bad. I like the mechanics tools, but they're, they're, they're workshop tools. You know, they're not, they're not the best. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Have so, I said sorry anything? about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, uh, we got a whole bunch of craftsman tools once on one of the TV shows we did. And I remember my brother picking up the, the belt sander, which I still have. He goes, this is like something you'd buy next to a hairdryer at a supermarket. <laughs> <That's what he laughs> said. <laughs> the quality of it was just, it honestly, and this is years ago, it, the, the quality of the tools just felt like they just went to some, some, Chinese uh, product fair and just pick like 10 tools that work from some no name manufacturer and said, put all logos on these tools. Mm. Yeah. And that's, that's probably, that's part of the problem when people do licensing. So Craftsman is such a huge brand. And what they basically do is they'll license their name to some sub manufacturer and that sub manufacturer just makes tools. And then you have some like college graduate PR guy that looks at it and goes, Oh, this is a cool tool. This looks great. And then it actually gets into the hands of people like you and me who actually use the tools. And we go, where in the long lines did this craftsman logo get on this POS <laughs> Chinese made, you know, things made in China can be good, but just the point I'm making is it just is a poor quality, you know, no attention to detail. You know, you could literally seize the motor if you grab the, the, the running wheel hard enough, you know, so you could stall it. So it's just funny to me, like these guys want, you know, they want to be perceived as all these things, but somewhere between them licensing their name and that product getting on the shelf, it all gets lost. Yeah. I mean, going back, to the, close attention. going back to the YouTube thing, I think, I don't know if we've talked about it on air, but I know we've talked about it off air, is that the future of television is probably going down where the younger generation, they're watching more YouTube and they think YouTube people are stars <laughs> right now. And I think we're, we're, we're sitting at a, at a good time where we're seeing this change. And I think if you're some, if you're an advertiser, and, or, and, and your client wants to sell something, the YouTube audience would is more the, – the demographic is you, – you can pinpoint your demographic in YouTube where you can't in television. You can yeah. put up a show on the DIY network, and you are reaching a wide demographic, a huge audience, and only right. a certain portion You can portion pinpoint. Of yeah, on YouTube you can pinpoint. Your money goes further. You also don't have to pay a team of 200 people. You're paying one person. So – you can offer a lower rate to a YouTuber, but saying, you know, here's a hundred bucks to show off your product. That's, I mean, that's, that's insulting, right? 
Like, you, yeah. yeah, you're advertising directly to the people you want to. So treat your YouTuber with respect. It is insulting. And not just, I don't mean just insulting to us who have been doing this for a little while and have reasonably big audiences. It's also insulting to the person who's just getting started and has a thousand people who watch a video. I mean, because that's, you're exactly right. That's a pinpointed 1,000 people that are exactly the demographic that an advertiser is looking to talk to. Mm -hmm. And there's no way, yeah, there's no, yeah, it is exactly distilled down to exactly who they want. And there's no way that you could target those same 1,000 people with a TV show. So, yeah, it's, don't hear us, if you're listening, don't hear us saying like, it's not fair to us and we're too good for this. It's it's not fair to anybody because the the platform is targeted the platform so no matter how big your channel is you're still targeting a very specific group of people and that should be taken into account and not only that but tv shows die and all these hg tv shows you're not going to be able to get the dvd set down the road they're just going to be gone forever but are these youtube videos they do live forever yeah yeah right i mean jimmy's got videos that are 10 years old right uh, I have one. My 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 left foot is 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 about ten years old. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I posted it. I guess when YouTube first started, but you know that was when I was first thinking of the concept of you know how to make videos. But yeah, th- so that's why I also said to this guy, I'm also going to start saying if if advertisers do come to me, and they do come to me, but I just give them these like blow off answers. But one one day I'm going to be able to develop a real relationship with somebody and say you know what, let's talk, let's have a real open, honest conversation and develop a strategy that works for both of us, which is what they don't do. You know, they just basically say, hey, we got some free tools. Will you jump through hoops for us for free tools? Um, but if, if I was able to get to that point where I could develop a real strategy with somebody, I could uh, develop a, you know, a, an honest relationship and uh, with my fans and tell my fans, hey, this is a, you know, a pretty decent tool and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Yeah, it'd be like it's a legit, you know, recommendation if you're yeah. 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 So speaking of tools, let's go on to the the thing where we were what was the topic? <laughs> what uh, tools are tool? you thinking of buying? What do you <laughs> want to get? Like I know we talked about this and of course my thing was the laser and uh we've talked about the Glowforge and you guys are actually getting the Glowforge, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I see I didn't put my order in yet. I'm waiting for my freebie. <laughs> I'm gonna whore myself out. <laughs> <laughs> So, See, there, there I'll take a free tool. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I have recently purchased, I think, three big tool purchases. And that's going to – that's I'm done for a while. I'm not going to have another major purchase for a long time, especially since we've had our plumbing disaster. And we're, yeah. we're focusing on the house. So like Jimmy said, I <clears throat> did get the Glowforge laser engraver, which doesn't ship till December or January. Uh, and then um, – I got tired of my Black & Decker. You know what? I'm not going to mention names. I got tired of my drill, which <laughs> <laughs> uh, not working. Then it died on me. And I'm like, I just want a good drill. So I bought, I did research, and then I, I bought the Festool drill. And then I also bought uh, the Festool brushless motor palm sander, uh, random orbit sander. One of my f- biggest pet peeves about random orbit sanders is it takes like five seconds to wind down. You know, you get done yes. with it, and then you want to do your thing, but you you have to hold on to it until it winds down. If you set it down, it vibrates, it falls off the bench or whatever. And I know five seconds seems like I'm a very impatient person, but when I know exactly what you mean, yeah, a, you want to. Keep, I usually keep a big pile of rags near me, and when I'm done sanding, I just throw it on the pile of rags. Ah, yes. And so, I mean, that five second means means a lot to me, especially if I'm in the zone and, and I got the flow going, and, and I'm and I'm working on all this stuff. I don't want to be interrupted. Or slowed down by this waiting for my hand sander to, you know, power off. And so, and I got this thing. It doesn't vibrate. It's really nice. I've, I have no affiliation with Festool, at least not yet. Um, but their products are really nice. Uh, I own three things, and they all are, they are the best at what they, they do. So, I don't have any big purchases coming up, but I've just made a few. And uh, I'm, I'm probably done for a long time as far as purchases. Yeah, I think me too. I mean, that Glowforge was a lot of money, you know, and that's, and honestly, I don't have room for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that plays a lot into it. And I mean, it really does. Like I, I would love to have something, you know, like a, a really big sander, <clears throat> like a surface sander thing 
but I have no place for that. So I couldn't justify both the money and justify have you know creating a spot for something like that. And so I think for me, I don't really have any other um, tool purchases planned. I think if anything, it would be starting to save up money to maybe someday turn my two car carport into a enclosed shop. So mm-hmm. actually, I actually have more room because the room would be way more valuable than you know any tool replacement that I could do or anything like that. Uh, just being able to have a little more space to work would be great. And I'm not complaining. I mean, I have a great space. I have more tools than I need and stuff like that. But, you know, you if know I was going to put money in, it would be towards space, I think. Yeah. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gearing up to try and build my space and you know, making the plans now and whatever. Um, but you know what I do? This is a funny thing I do. When I, when I think to myself, okay, I have all the tools that I think I need and I really don't need anything else. And I did this this last couple nights. I'll go on Craigslist and I'll just start fishing through the images of ads for tools. And then I start thinking, I'm like, oh, okay, I think I do need one of these. <laughs> and then I, whatever it is, I'll just Google that name and there'll be like 50 of them. And then I'll, then I, I, of course, I check New York's Craigslist. I check Brooklyn, Long Island, and then I check Albany, Rensselaer County, all the counties up here because it's always, so my circle is pretty wide. I'll even go to Pennsylvania if I need something. Uh, so the other day I did that. I just went on Craigslist and I just started brainstorming. It's what I call it, called brainstorming, fishing for tools and seeing what I need. And I saw the tool that I think, David, you have one, that big drum sander. You could stick it through and the wood oh. goes through like a planer. Yeah. What yeah. is that called? Is that a top a, sander, surface, surface a sander? drum sander. Yeah, that's what I was talking about too. Yeah, a drum. Yeah, that's what reminded me, a drum sander. So I started looking online for different drum sanders at about 20, 20 inches wide. I think I saw like a, a jet. For about it was about twenty inches wide. Is, mm-hmm. How big is yours? Mine is ten inches wide, but it has an opened end, so you can right. stick one side through it and then flip the board around and do the other side. Right. So I started seeing them for a couple hundred bucks, and uh, uh, so I'm fishing around for that. Did you yeah. Did you want to interject? I, if uh, a quick tip, if you're in the searching for a drum sander phase, is uh, a lot of the problems that you'll have with drum sanders is the sandpaper gets hot real quick and then starts to burn or clogs up. So on the bigger, for whatever reason, drum sanders are crazy expensive. But on the really crazy expensive bigger ones, uh, the sandpaper will be between two drums and is much longer Hmm. and has time to cool as it makes its rounds. Where on the smaller ones, there's no time for the sandpaper to cool. So if if you can afford it, get one with a bigger belt is your cat reminding you to say all these points can, about can the you, drum set? yeah can you hear my cat crying in the background Ow. yeah Ow. he's saying don't forget to tell them skinny one. <laughs> he, he was saying he was saying or you could just put ice on the wood <laughs> as you push it through the sand <laughs> yes yeah no what he actually is saying is please audience please tell david to feed me please he doesn't feed me <laughs> he's a jerk he gets fed all the time no that's a good point though because you said there's there's a sander that takes a bigger belt mm-hmm. than so it has time. That's definitely a good point. Other than that, because I do, I have noticed those things do burn. Yep. I've seen there was there was a shop that I used to visit that had one, and then you have the big giant ones you could stick like a a door through. Yeah. So uh, speaking of sanders, what's is there a name for the sander that you have that you used? You use it a lot for metalwork, and it has the really thin strip, and then oh like, yeah, that's a like, Beaumont sander. What's why is that a, a different? Of- Different kind a of belt stuff. grinder, yeah. I, it's called a, a Belmont. A Beaumont is the company that makes the one I have. I have two of them now because one of my YouTube fans who lived up here moved, and he called me and said, "I know I live within a few miles of you." He said, "I'm moving and I'm selling all my stuff," so I ended up buying that and a few other things from him. So now I have one up here, which is going to be in my file knife video, um, and then one in the city. And I use it. I, I can just imagine the knife nerds pulling the hair out when they see me like sanding everything on it. I sand wood. It's just it, it's just sandpaper. It's but some you, the paper you buy could be more designed to, for metal grinding. But it, to me, it's sandpaper. It still works. So I just sanded the 200 hand letter, cut letters on the thing, the one I have here. It's a, it's a 72 by 2 inch belt. And uh, the guys on Tested have shown the one. They have one that lays sideways. So you have the 72 inch belt that lays sideways. Mm. Mine is upright. And it's just a Beaumont belt grinder. And it's a basically a belt sander. And, and that's something that I wanted for a long time. When I called them and told them you know, I wanted to order it, they said, oh, well, there's a waiting list. Do you want to go on the waiting list? And I said, sure. 
And then about two months later, I got a call out of nowhere. They're like, you want it? We're ready to ship it to you if you want it. We made one with your name on it. I said, awesome. So they sent it to me. And then, of course, a second one came into my life. And uh, it's what Luis has been talking about online. Did you guys follow the thread with the Luis Gonzalez is trying to get one to go to Puerto Rico? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this it's also the same type of one he wants. Um, uh, so Beaumont Belt Grinder, they come in all different manufacturers, make them and um, I, I'm not endorsing them or anything. I just happen to like it. And a lot of guys make their own. You know, it's just a couple of chunks of metal with some wheels and a motor. And if you make it to accommodate a 72 inch long belt, you could buy the belts online. Mm. But I, I love it. I bought it because I knew I wanted to get into knife making, and of course, it's there. And so I stick everything in it. I use it for grinding brass, wood, plastic, anything. And then it has a couple of wheels, so you could use those wheels to your advantage if you're standing inside of a curve or whatever. And they have the wheels there have three different sizes. So part of the belt is actually against the plate. Part of the belt is in the open air. So you could push on it and get that subtle curve out of it. But I, I've also been wanting a big disc sander like Frank Haworth has. It's a 24-inch big, big giant disc sander. I, I talked about in the beginning of our podcast I was going to try and make one for myself. But I keep finding them online. Eventually, I'll find one where it works, where I can just go pick it up. You know, when I say, you know, I find one that's for sale in Arizona or, you know, some other faraway state. Uh, I'll be driving to Knoxville in a couple of weeks, so I'm definitely going to be looking for stuff along the way between here and Knoxville. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's kind of how I shop for tools when I look. You know, if I know I'm going to go a far away place, I'll start looking in the region. When Dave and I drove out to Kansas City, we were looking on Craigslist for anything interesting. But you know, it, it, nothing really shows up that I can't otherwise just get here. So there's no reason to drag it. So when, unless something really cool shows up, mm. you know. But yeah, so I guess for me, I'm looking for the sanders, either the, that big surface sander or that big disc disc sander. That's something that I would like. And I would definitely bring it straight upstate. I wouldn't even bring it to the city. Uh, I'm working more and more up here as time goes on. And, uh, and I'm having to work in the open air. I might even buy a new container. If I bought a new container, it wouldn't be for storage. It would be for literally for shop space. So hmm. that's, another, that's another thing I'm considering. These are just shipping containers? Yeah, for, for it's thirty five hundred dollars for a shipping container. The guy drops it off, and then all of a sudden, you have a full waterproof enclosure, no huh. permits, no license. You know, well, I, I live out here in the boondocks. I could set a car on fire in my driveway, and nobody would even lift their head or call the fire department. They go, "Oh, he must be burning garbage." <laughs> yeah, when, uh, when we were in Cleveland a few weeks ago, there was like down the street, there was a line of like four or five of them, and people had turned them into like little businesses. Like, oh yeah. Yeah, and I've seen tiny houses made out of them too. That's yeah, sure, sure. So that I mean, that's the reason why I'm buying them. It, well, I'm, I bought one, and then I might buy this other one because the 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 hope and dream is that once the big building is up, I can then use them and stick them out somewhere on the 25 acres and put, make them into like little destination homes, huh. you know, or like little cabins out in the. I actually have I have two properties beside each other. One is uh, one is 17 acres, and one is 23. So together they're 40. So hmm. uh, the one is beside. The, the one I'm on. So that's why I'm saying I would take it and shove it out there somewhere, you know, but who knows? There's so much work has to be done before then. I would love to see the video of you building um, a catapult to be able to shoot one of those out into your property. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so, it's so, uh, it's so, what do you say? Rural out here to drag that into, I'd have to literally cut a path because there's no path. You can't even yeah. walk from where, like to walk, like we cut a path to the beaver pond on my property. And uh, so to do that was like, you know, a two week, two week struggle to finally make a path that we could take the quad and go out to the beaver pond. And so now these little pathways that we've been cutting around the property are like starting to turn into our own personal little roadways. Hmm. But if you don't drive on them for a couple of weeks, they overgrow. Can I ask you a question that'll put you on the spot? Yeah, go ahead. So in last week's Makers and Shakers, the yep. question of the week was, if you're stuck on a deserted island, what tool would you have? <laughs> Do you remember what your answer was? A butter knife. A butter knife. So <laughs> many people want to know, including me, what you would do with a butter knife. Well, the reason I thought of a butter knife, it's funny. I mean, I was just trying to think of, obviously, a funny answer that you could riff on, of course. But honestly, what I thought of was a moment when I was a kid that my father did a good job of keeping all shop object, objects away from me and my brothers when we were real little. But I remember getting my hands on a butter knife 
and I thought to myself, wow, this is a butter knife. But it's not like a razor blade that I wasn't allowed to touch, but it was a butter knife. I must have been five or six years old. And I remember sharpening it on the sidewalk. I remember taking it and just grinding it on the sidewalk <laughs> left to right. And then I found like a sidewalk with like a little groove in it. And I used the, the top of the knife, rubbing it in the groove to try and get that butter, that soft butter to try and turn into an actual sharp point. So I was like a six or seven year old trying to make a, sh- a prison shiv before I knew what a prison shiv was. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just, I immediately thought of like, if I had no tools at all, what would be the one tool? And my memory immediately was like, hey, remember that time you played with that butter knife when you were a little kid? And so that was, that was the anatomy of that answer. It was, I just remembered a time when I was a little kid playing with that butter knife. And I, you know, having a piece of metal on a, on a deserted island with no other tools Regardless of whether it's sharp or not, it's definitely something to have because when you think of like rock, paper, scissor, if you were stuck on an island and you had a piece of metal, regardless of the shape, I'm sure you could turn it into a couple of different uses. Yeah. You could use, you know, of course, rock is, depending on the size of the rock, you could use the rock and vice versa. So, you know, it's always nice to challenge your, your intellect to see hmm. what and how you could, you know, beat your way out of a paper bag. I am I am one hundred percent satisfied with your answer. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> Any other questions about my childhood? Uh, oh, we have Can't a lot. So many. We should do an entire episode on questions about. Childhood. I, I said it in front of uh, the Pittsburgh Make Fair. I think I was talking about all kinds of curious things. I probably said it here. I don't know. If you guys meet me in person, I have a big scar around my eye. It's like goes through my eyebrow. And it, now I'm getting old. It's just turning into a wrinkle, so you can't really tell. But in my youthful. Uh, when my, my skin was more youthful, you could literally see, you could see it sticking out of the glasses right there, right there. Mm-hmm. That scar uh, was from the end of a, of a hammer. When I picked up, as a kid, I picked up a sledgehammer over my head and it fell against my eye. I realized I was too weak to be able to hold it up. So I picked it up over my head like Thor. And then once it got to the point that I couldn't pick it up anymore, it started coming back towards my face. Oh, man. And, and the, uh, the whole open end of the sledgehammer hit me right on the orbit of my eye and cut Ow. me through the, the, the cheekbone and all the way through my eyebrow. Hmm. So... That was when I was about three or four years old. So that was my first experience with a hammer that I remember. <laughs> so I was always getting hurt and doing stuff with, with tools. And I mean, I, people always say, how did I you know, get the knowledge I have? And, and I say all the time, it's just curiosity, being curious and you know, mm-hmm. blowing getting, things up, setting things on cut. fire, getting cut. getting cut. And I'm like, oh, wow, if I jam that really hard and my hand slips, I'm going to get cut. Now I know. Yeah. I'm constantly yeah. hurting myself in the shop. Almost every single day, but it's never with a spinning blade or something sharp. It's like I hit my head or I bump my hip or I smash my finger. I, I'm so clumsy and maybe it's just the size of my shop. It's so small and everything is so tight, but uh, it's, uh, you know what it, you know what it is too. It happens to me when I say, when I'm really focused on something that I know I need to do, I like when you draw like the straight lines between the activity and the shop and the straight line has a little bend in it because you have to walk around the saw. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly hitting my hip on that. So, so I got to go from here to here. I got to go from there to the sander, to the band, so to the sander, to the here. Yeah. And like, if they're not perfectly straight lines, I'm like, <laughs> I'll rip my pocket open on the lay on the, uh, you know, the open end of the lathe happens to me all the time. Mm. So I, that's really what it is when I'm determined to finish something. If I have a tight timeline, my, my bends and curves become straight lines and that's how I tear <laughs> up a pocket. <laughs> it's true. I just, if I ever get hurt, it's because I'm, <clears throat> I'm just trying to work too fast. I'll just like get ahead of myself and you know. Like, yeah, that's that's basically what I was. You know, similar similar thing. I just get careless with like little things, and yeah, I'm the same way. I've never had like a spinning blade type of injury. I have shot a brad nail through my finger. That was not fun. Ah, but, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> not through my finger, okay. into my finger. Okay. Deeply. I guess I actually on camera. It's on camera too, but I'll never find it because it was it was with one of the Prativia production companies. I was I was nailing a bunch of stuff, and I kept taking out quarter inch, eighteen gauge nails and putting in two inch, eighteen gauge nails. So I kept going back and forth between the the two different size nails, and I forgot I had two inch, eighteen gauge nails in the nail gun. And I picked it up, and I had my hand near, and the the nail went directly through the quarter inch material I was nailing, and went in and out of my knuckle. It oh. went in one side and out of the other side. So an 18 gauge mm-hmm. nail went completely through my knuckle, the mm-hmm. point pointing yes. at my, the, my bent pointer finger. And I immediately <laughs> yanked it right out. I, you know, my reaction was to pull away. So the nail stayed in the wood and it came. So 
I had an 18 gauge two inch nail went directly through my knuckle. And as soon as I was done, I had a, a red spot on one side of my knuckle and on the other side of my knuckle, there was a red spot. So mm. it went all the way through my finger uh, in an instant. You know, you and the cameraman who filmed it just looked at me and goes, wow, that must really hurt. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I was like, as long as my finger still works, it, it felt like my, my finger got like exploded with dynamite. That's oh, how much pain man. I was in. But and, there was no physically nothing except for the two dots, the in and the in and the out. Wow. Wound. Merchandise idea for you, Jimmy. Poster of just like your hands and like a diagram with all the different injuries. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> that left no scar. The only thing I was worried about was, of course, the, the severe pain I was in for about three hours. I was afraid I was going to get an infection in my bone because mm. it, it, it just like punctured and came right through. It went completely through my finger and back out. But I was afraid I was going to get an infection because I know bone infections are like impossible to get rid of. And the basic, the only way to get rid of them is to like remove that digit or that, you know. My friend had a bone infection in his foot, and the doctor said, you know what, it's probably easy to remove your foot and give you a prosthetic foot than try and solve this problem. And that's what he ended up doing. So that, that was in the back of my mind, my friend who lost his foot from a car accident. But his foot was okay. They, they healed it, but that bone infection just wouldn't go away. So I immediately thought I was going to get an infection through my bone. Hmm. But I didn't, thankfully. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Be careful so, in the shop, everybody. Please, slow <laughs> yeah. down. Make sure we just... Buy two 18 gauge nails, one for short nails and one for long nails. <laughs> That's why tip. I have 25 tools of everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did we yeah. have another topic? We were going to talk about what brought us on YouTube. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys have any? Just like a, I, I have a quick answer. And I said it recently. The other night I was on Maritime Woodworkers. And uh, I, I, immediately, I, I initially started YouTube because I wanted to prove to the television production company that I was working for. Well, uh, Discovery Channel that they kind of they 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 lost the they lost the good thing. So it was kind of like when a girl breaks up with you and you try and find a better looking girlfriend to prove to her that you know she lost the good looking. <laughs> That's basically that was my motivation. It was just I was kind of jealous and angry that they didn't carry on with the show because we we were having fun and they basically took away my good time and I said you know what I'm going to have a good time without you and I was like yeah I'm going to yeah. do it without. Yeah, and I'm really happy I did because, like I said in the past, my my motivating factor now has changed. It was initially revenge, and and now it's to inspire and to educate and entertain, and you know, and and it does all those things for me too. So that's it's extremely rewarding. Hmm. That was my initial thing. I basically said if I'm going to do another TV show, I'm going to have my own audience that they can't ignore. And now I don't even want to do a TV show, so I'm happy that it came this far. Yeah, you you found your path. Yeah. I've, I've talked about my story many times, but basically I took wood shop in high school and then 20 years went by and as a dog, uh, as a hobby photographer, I wanted to get some photos framed and I found out the cost of the framing and I thought it was expensive. Like I want to get into woodworking and make my own frames. Started watching The Wood Whisperer and Steve Ramsey and I kind of, um, my name the drunken woodworker started off as a joke with me and a buddy drinking whiskey in the in the backyard. And he's like, let's do one more shot and go make a desk down in your basement. Joking, of course. <laughs> and so I started I started uh, my Facebook page, The Drunken Woodworker. And it started off as a joke. And then people started liking it because of the name and um, because of my influence on from people like Steve and, and Mark. I started making my own videos and I had a video background along with an audio background and a marketing background and a design background and and um, it just kind of it kind of took off and it, it's mostly because of Mark and Steve. I didn't I actually didn't discover you Jimmy until um, quite a bit after that. So and uh, and and here we are. Kids started making my boxes and class and i had to change my name because it got embarrassing and uh so we, i recently dropped the drunken woodworker and and now like making videos is my passion i love the the video making part just as much if not more than the the woodworking part like if yeah. you if you want to do this you have to love making videos because it's a big part of of your time it it, it takes just as much effort to make the video as it does to make the thing that's in the video. Yeah. Yeah. I would I, say like my, for me, it's actually more work to do like doing the actual project is I can almost do that on autopilot generally, you know, but then when you're starting to make the video, you have to think about ways to make that process more interesting. And mm -hmm. then you have to do all the extra work after the fact But yeah, it's like a more work than the actual project for sure. What were you saying, Jimmy? Um, 
I was uh, I was just talking the other day about uh, you know how much I, I actually with the Maritime Woodworkers interview how much I like making the videos. I start I'm starting to think of each one of my my videos as like a rock song and like how it's like I try to keep it timeless. I don't put dates on them or anything like that. And so that that my evolution as a YouTuber has gotten to that point where now like when I think of a, a video that I want to make or if I start sculpting in the video in, in the edit. I really start thinking of it as like a, as like a song. I mean, you guys are musicians. I don't think of myself as a musician, but you know, the idea of making that one like encapsulated like piece of artwork and and keeping it that way. So for me, it, it's making it more and more rewarding by doing it that way. You know, keeping mm. keeping that that state of mind or keeping that in mind. And a lot, a lot of times the payoff is even bigger doing the video because not only do I have this this thing that I'm really proud of that I made, but I also have the documentation of that and, and sharing that with everybody else and getting that, that feedback. And we all know 99% of that feedback is, is good, positive thoughts and, and words. So, yeah. Yeah. For me, um, you know, like I've, I've told my story as well before, but I think actually getting into the video portion of it, um, I, for a long time, well, not a long time, for a couple of years, I was doing music on YouTube. And so I was making these, I was recording music and then filming the process of recording the music. And then I would go back after the song was mixed and make a video showing the recording process. And they call them video songs. And it was a, a thing that was happening a lot. It's probably still going on. But <clears throat> so I got started doing video for that and then built those skills up and, you know, some audio engineering skills and stuff. And then when it came, I was trying to do my blog and I found that, you know, I remembered how much more I enjoyed making the video and editing videos than I did writing these big long blog posts that were like super descriptive about how many nails you need in this thing and all, you know. And uh, so then I just decided to start trying to do some video of the same projects that I was already going to be writing about. And as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, forget writing. <laughs> I'm just going to do video from now on. <laughs> but now you do the writing and the video, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> uh, Yeah. The writing now that I do is basically to summarize a video that I already made. And that seems easier than, to me than like trying to figure out, to remember, you know, between this step and this step, what did I do exactly? And like, how did I, what did I have to put into it? And yeah. uh, now I can just watch it and write about what I did. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, that's probably a good answer for all that, unless anybody else has anything no. more to say about that. And I, I, I'm pretty sure. And I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm pretty sure my thoughts and feelings and my the way my videos are done is always going to change as I'm always trying to find what works best it, for mm -hmm. me, what yeah. satisfies me and and works with my time frame. And um, like I, I've said it before, I'm always trying to develop my style and my style as what I'm making and my style in the presentation of that, too. So. Uh, it's mm -hmm. always going to change and I'm yeah. always going to try to get better. You know, kind of going back to my point of me making 10 bottle openers. If you make hundreds of videos or, you know, tens of tens of tons of video, tens and tens of videos up to a hundred, you really start to get into a groove and you really start to, to get outside your, your comfort zone and, and the things that you, you kind of keep relying on. So, mm -hmm. you know, as YouTubers and content creators, you know, in general, you know, us and whoever's listening who does that as well, the more you make, the, the more you're forced to just continually come up with good new stuff. And, and is, there's so many times where somebody says, you know, I'm going to make videos soon. I just I just need to figure out my my style or, or what type of videos I'm going to do. And I always tell them, you know, you got to start making videos first because you don't know until you're yeah. deep yeah. in the trenches of editing and shooting. So don't if, if you if you're thinking about getting into it. Just do it. Use whatever equipment you have. You don't need special lighting. You don't need crazy yep. fancy cameras. Use your phone. You know. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Um. Well, let's. Uh, you want to talk about what we're watching? You guys sure. see anything cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, there's this guy, Paul Jackman, Jackman Carpentry. Uh, oh, Paul's awesome. He is awesome, and I don't know if you've been paying much attention, but his videos are getting more film like. As he's, he's just, they're, they're, 
it's all it's all woodworking stuff and the quality of his videos are just getting better and better and better and he's getting really really good at telling the story and showing some unique perspective and angles and and everything on how he's making stuff so check out jackman carpentry yep i've been watching dirty smith actually uh uh J jesse turned me on to him on twitter the other day so it was a public uh Twitter that Jesse turned me on to him, Jesse from Rochester, and uh, I've been watching him. I really like him. I've been getting a little bit into Blacksmith. His name is, uh, my page is locked. Here it is, Rory May, R-O-R-Y-M-A-Y, Dirty Smith, and he's, uh, he's, a, he's a young YouTube channel, um, but he's a guy that grew up doing blacksmithing. Did I already talk about him? I don't think I don't I think did. so. I don't no. think no, so. I, talked, I might have talked about him the other night on the Maritime Woodworking Show. Anyway, he's the one I've been watching all week long, and... and uh, He's funny. He's got a funny uh, point of view. But what I love about him is is he's been doing it his whole life, and that comes through. So it's so natural for him to teach. It's just something he obviously – I think he even might have commented that he learned it from his dad. So he grew up in a family of doing blacksmithing, and, and it just comes through that it's sort of second nature to him. So it's so easy for him to teach because it's just such second nature – activities that he's talking about so hmm. and he's a little funny he actually cracks a beer every video and he gets a little negative comments about drinking and the more he gets the comments the more he drinks so <laughs> <laughs> so he's got a funny sense of humor i think he's in colorado so check him out he's only has uh i'm looking at his page now he's got five thousand subscribers he deserves to have more hmm. so take a look yeah go check him out um have i talked about wheezy waiter before I'm no not sure i don't think okay so, so <clears throat> this guy named craig um, he's been doing YouTube for, I don't even know how long, really long time. And he was one of the first channels that I ever found and subscribed to. And he, um, was a waiter. He had asthma. So he, and he got fed up with his job. So he went to start making videos talking about his job. So he picked wheezy waiter and he's, he's really funny and it's just comedy. It's like, you know, a lot of him just talking to the camera about goofy stuff. And he, he's created all these like, um, little, jokes like inside jokes that if you watch his videos for very long you know that he punches this eagle all the time and it's just it's like this <laughs> cut out little image of a of an eagle you know like a clip art thing that he moves across the screen and he reaches up and he punches it and but he also does really complex stuff like he does a lot of cloning so he has in his videos clones of himself doing chores in his house and he interacts with these clones like sings harmony with them and oh, you know all hands stuff to them and He's really good at that stuff, and he's really funny. And um, yeah, so I've been watching him for a long. Oh, and a funny thing about them: one time I'm sitting there watching this video. He has a beard, and he always talks about beards, and just like it's one of his running jokes. And uh, so he's wa yeah, I'm watching this video. He's going along. He's talking about beards, and all of a sudden he says something about a baby with a beard, and he shows this picture in the video of a baby with a beard, and it's my son. What? So a few years ago, several years. Oh, I'm, few, I'm looking at his thing now. A few years before cool. this, a friend of mine, when my my oldest son was born, my friend um, photoshopped on a beard onto this like six month old little boy, and it's really really funny. And we have the image, and somehow it got, you know, like in Google search. <laughs> and so this guy Weezy Waiter just went and searched for baby with a beard and found this picture of this little baby with the beard and put it in this video. And so I'm watching this video, and I'm like, whoa. Wait a second. What, what video was it? I'm on his channel now. What video I, was it? It was several years ago. I'd have to find uh, it. I don't know. Maybe I'll find it and put it in the Did you the comment channel. on it? Yeah, I did. And he was just like, no way. And I was like, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. So anyway, but it's a really funny channel. He's a, he's a funny guy and it's, you know, silly comedy and stuff, but uh, worth watching. So, nice. and, and you know, sometimes we recommend these channels that have nothing to do with building or making or woodworking or whatever but i gather so much inspiration from these other channels because i'm looking at not only what the entertainment aspect of it but i'm looking how their their graphics or how they do yeah. their cuts and mm -hmm. and how they talk on screen and you can find inspiration anywhere so i that's love true. i love the entertainment ones so yeah. and that's a good point because the way that i cut my my to camera stuff, the where I talk to the camera and I do the jump cuts and I'm very specific about the fast cuts. That was all directly from this guy. Nice. That's stuff that I learned because he was one of the first people that I started watching. So yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, we got anything else this week? Oh uh, yeah. I just want to talk a little bit. I'm involved in a thing called 
Make It Forward, and I think it's on Twitter. Make It Forward is on Twitter uh, at Make It Forward. And I'm involved with a crew of guys, and we make something, and then we give it to the next guy, and then he makes and adds to it, and then we give it to the next guy, and he makes and adds to it. And then at the end, we auction it off for charity. Oh, cool. And So let me just say a couple of the guys that are involved. This is Mark Dolan at Mark Penn's. Uh, Brian McCauley, who we all hung out with in WIA, and that's uh, McCauley Designs. And Brian Fisher, uh, I can't read this thing, Im- Improbable Construction, I think is what it is. And Sean Rubio, we hung out with Sean and, mm-hmm. and uh, at Sean Rubio. And, and Kip Vandor at Iron Face underscore. And um, so I'm involved with making a chess set. And each one of the guys involved made different parts of the chess set. And I'm going to be making the chess pieces. So... Keep an eye out for that. I'm actually going to make a video of my my part of it, and I think along the way people have been making their videos of, of their parts of it as well. Awesome. So cool. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, a real quick, uh, I got an email from a Beth Watson, and she said that uh, her partner Dan Martinelli today is his birthday, and, and she asked if we could wish him a happy birthday. Oh. So yeah. I just oh, wanted to birthday. say happy birthday, Dan. Yeah, Wait, okay. is it today today or Friday Friday? Uh, October 27th, so today today. Oh, okay. So, today today. Surprise. I don't think happy he knows birthday. that we said happy birthday. So He does oh, now. Cool. He does well, now. Now we're going to get a thousand of those. That'll be fun. No more. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> no It'll more. be like all these fake names. And we're going to have to do like everyone's birthday roll call. It's like Sandy Feet, happy birthday. Um, <laughs> Sandy Feet. <laughs> <laughs> We'll wish you a happy birthday if you contribute on Patreon. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm joining Patreon. Oh, yes. Let's so. talk about that real quick. Rewards. Yeah, I'm going to join Patreon. Uh, I have a lot of videos that people haven't seen. And I have a lot of videos that, that sit around before they get published, such as my Core 77 videos. And, and a lot of my YouTube videos that I kind of – sometimes I have to get uh, client clearance. And so uh, – they're sitting around waiting for that. So, I, and I have some of them that did never that never did get client clearance. But I'd be happy to show them to a small audience. Um, I'm sure they wouldn't mind. Um, so that's what I have to offer right now. I'm just going to kind of sneak peek videos and show videos that nobody has seen. And then I'm sure if I know me, I'll be making some interesting content. I do a lot of Snapchat stuff. Maybe I'll actually save my Snapchats and save them uh, to show them on my on my uh, to my Patreons. So, cool, cool. We'll put like a that. link to that. It's not live yet, right? It's not. Yeah, no. I'll, I'll make it live, so maybe it'll be in the link by the time Friday comes around. Cool. Yeah. So. All right. Well, speaking of Patreon, um, I want to thank Luis Gonzalez and Jeremy White because they're our top patrons for the podcast over there, and uh, we are really grateful to them and everybody else that helps us out. Uh, so, if you guys want to support the show, you can go to Patreon.com/slash Making It. Thank you. Thank. That would be awesome. Um, we got anything else? I'm I'm out of stuff. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> we need we need topics. So if anybody wants to send us topics, things you want to hear us talk about, ideas about shows, yeah. send them along. And if you are interested in signing up for the YouTube Red thing, it starts tomorrow from when we're recording this. So by the time this goes up, it'll be available. You know, I don't know. I guess everybody has to decide if there's value in that for them, but it will be actually going up soon. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, right and you get, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you also get uh, the subscription to Google Music, right? Not, Which, uh, to the YouTube Music, not Google. Uh, I think you get Google Play as well, I thought. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, well, maybe. It's like a little, little add-on bonus, which I know, Bob, you are completely against. <laughs> I'm not music. against. <laughs> I, just <don't, laughs> I just don't want to put money into it. Yeah. But, hey, you know, I'm probably going to sign up for the YouTube Red thing, so I'll get it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's worthwhile to me. All right. Anyway, that'll do it for us, us this week, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I love everybody. <laughs> everybody. 